In this video, we will talk about statistic game. So there is two perspectives to get statistic game. First one comes from the Markov chain, and we extend it from no player to one player to multiple players. And the second per, uh, perspective come from game theory. We start from the static game to dynamic game, and then uh, add some randomness to have the statistic game. So let's go uh, first for the first uh, for the Markov chain. Markov chain is a dynamic probabilistic model, um, which contains three elements: state, stage, and transition probability. So let's give an example of weather transition. So suppose that we care about the weather from the current or um, from today to some future day t. So the stage will be day one, day two, to some day t. And this day t can be infinity. And we have three states here, either cloudy, rainy, or sunny. Which means that for each day t, um, the state can be only one of these three. And we'll have a transition probability telling us that if today is cloudy, um, tomorrow will be sunny with probability 40%. Running for thirty percent and still be cloudy for ten percent, and it's called Markov chain because the transition probability have the Markov property, which says the transition uh, depends on only the current day, only uh, doesn't depends on the all the previous day. So Markov chain has a great application uh, in a lot of areas to to give a model of this transition. But there's one thing missing in Markov chain. That is, we have no control of this entire process. So a direct extension is that we have the Markov decision process, which have an actually action consider. So under different action, you will have different transition probability. And um, also you will get a, a reward based on the action you take and the state you were in. And now we have the actions. We will also introduce um, the, this performance metric. Our objective will become an optimization problem, which is to find the best policy, which is a mapping from state to action. So this policy is like a lookup table. It tells you what action I should take when I'm at state S. For example, if it's raining, I should bring an umbrella. If sunny, then I should not bring an umbrella. Um, and um, we want to find this policy so that we can maximize the expected accumulated utility. So there is three part of this objective function. First part is the summation of all the t, which means that we are not trying to myopically optimize the current reward. Um, this uh, this one, you see that. Um, it's R as A, but A is an outcome of this function, phi. So we just replace A to be phi S. So we are actually summing over all the future and the current reward. So we, we want to we, we want to consider long term optimal. Long term optimal. And there's a discounted factor beta, which is a number between zero to one. So this discounted factor it tells you um, that a dollar in the future has less value for a dollar in, in, in today. Because think of an example that if you get a one dollar today, you can save it into the bank and get interest, although maybe neglectable. And the third part is that because there is a transition probability, so all the future state is now deterministic. Uh, we need to take expectation over this randomness. So this will become our objective function of MDP. And one more thing is like um, there is a relationship between the current hot topic like reinforcement learning and MDP. So um, the idea is that in the real world, in the real world, you may not be able to know the closed form of the transition probability and the reward. So what you should do uh, is that you take an action and 
and and interact with the environment, you get a reward and then the future state. So although you don't have the model, you have the reward and the the, the future states. So you can get some information and probably learn、uh, the best policy during these iterations.、Uh, we have the MDP. We want to solve it、um, by dynamic programming. So I will first introduce what is dynamic programming. It has the philosophy of divide it and conquer. So suppose you have a huge problem.、Um, You want to divide it into sub problem and solve them one by one, so that in the in the end you solve the entire problem. So, for example, let try to solve the sh- let try to find the shortest path from the start node to this end node. So all this number on these links will be the length of the row. So you see that in this graph we are automatically considering accumulated cost. Because we are summing,、uh, we are sum summing over all this number to get the shortest path over this node to this node, and the transition is finite and deterministic, and the discounted factor beta is equal to one, which means that there's no penalty for the future state. So the most direct way is to brute forcefully searching for all the possible paths, like here, here, here. Here, so so you see that it's、um, it's not good if you have a very large network and very complicated connections. So what we do is that first, suppose that you arrive at this stage three. Suppose you are at this node. What action you should take? You should take this action, right? Because you have no other choices. You take that this action, and the length from here to here will be two. So you write it here、uh, as two, and three, four for these nodes, and then you go one step further. You solve this sub problem. You go one step further to get stage two. So if you start from this node, you have two actions to take, either this way or this way. Which action you should take?、Um, if you take this action, the future reward will be three. So you get six in total. If you take this action, you take Ah,、uh, five plus two gets seven, which means that if you arrive at this node, you should choose this path and get a value of six. This value is、uh, called optimal cost to go. It's the optimal cost starting from this stage to the final stage. Similarly, you have six and five for these two nodes, and seven, eight, twelve for these nodes, and finally it comes to the to final nodes. So you see, ah,、uh, if you take, you have three options here. If you take this node, you get twelve. This node, you get eleven. Take this node, you take、uh, you get thirteen. So which action you should take? You should take three, and get total of eleven. So eleven will be the shortest path, and and also the red path is automatically you you find it. And one more thing is like we see that if you myopically choose the shortest, um, shortest path for for just one stage. You would you would go from here to here, and which is not the optimal over the entire graph. And all these numbers will be called the value function or optimal cost to go. So back to our problem, we see that we have the objective function here, and optimal cost to go. Um. So this optimal cost to go or the value function is the maximum. Of our objective function over all the possible policy, so five star will be the optimal policy, and、uh, if you、um, plug in this optimal policy, you got a function that only related related to the initial state. So for different initial state, you have different value function, and we can see also see that from our example here. For different node here, you get different value. And、um, from the the dynamic programming, we will、uh, have the optimality principle, which says that if you are optimal from here to here, then on this optimal path starting from any po- any point, you will also get optimal from that point from that 
point to the end, which is ob obvious as you see here. And, and based on this principle, we will have Wellman equation, which says, um, suppose you, you are at state S T, then the optimal cost to go from here will be the summation of the current reward at here and all the future um, possibilities. So you, so this is the transition probability. So you just take expectation over all this possibility. And suppose you arrive here, you will get value function of VST. So basically the same idea as finding the shortest path. And um, it's the optimal, so we try to maximum over all the possible A. So this is the current reward. This is the expected future reward. And we see that this Bellman equation will become um, a problem that you try to find the fixed point of this function, V, here, right? Because this is true for all the possible initial state ST. So we can write it in a, in, in a vector form. So to solve the dynamic programming, there's a, like you can use value iteration or policy iteration. And here we are using linear programming. So we write dynamic programming, this Bellman equation, into an objective function and a constraint. So the idea is that we want to achieve the equality. So we say the left-hand side should always be bigger or equal to the right-hand side. And we are trying to minimize the left-hand side. So at the um, optimal point, you actually achieve the equality. And also, we see that there is a maximum over A, so it should be bigger than um, the maximum A. So it should means that it should be bigger than all the possible A. So basically, we represent this nonlinear max operation operator to a group of linear constraints for all the possible A. And one more thing is that um, we um, yeah, so, so let's give a graph uh, to the illustration of, of what this means. So suppose we have just two states, um, state 1 or state 2. So we have value 1, value 2. Then the feasible reason will be something like that. And you and this objective function will be a line. So you move the line around, try to find the minimum, and you find that this point will be the optimal. And this weights uh, have been proved here is that any pos po positive weight bigger than zero will make no difference to the optimal point. So that uh, so it's simple because when you change alpha, you're actually changing the angle of this line. But no matter how you change the line and move around, you will also also hit this point, always hit this point, and this is not changing. So we have finished MDP and how to solve them. Um, the touch the game is just extension to a multi-agent. So now the 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 the, the marker chain is not controlled by one player, but controlled by n players. And which means the transition probability is determined by the action of n players, and each player will get a reward based on the global state s and each action of each players. And we have the similar objective for each player, which is selfish and rational, that they want to find a policy which is a mapping from the global state to uh, the action of himself. So he wants to take an action so that he can maximize his own utility. But we see that the solution concept of optimality doesn't apply here because the reward depends on the action of all players. And especially when we're considering like cybersecurity, we have a defender attacker, they have natural confrontation. So we cannot expect the other players to cooperate with us so that uh, so so that our our so that we get uh our best utility for ourselves. So that's why we will introduce the solution of equilibrium from the game theory, which says that at equilibrium if everybody remain the same, 
same policy, and you change your own policy, it will not bring you any benefit. So in in that sense, in that sense, nobody will want to change from the equilibrium, and that's why it's called equilibrium equilibrium because nobody will move. So now we have an example. Let's suppose that we have only two players. One is a defender, the other is the attacker, and the, also they have zero sum objectives, which means that uh, at same state, same action, the reward is has some summation of zero or some constant c. So now you see p1 want to maximize r1, p2 want to maximize r2. However, because r2 equal to minus r1, so p p2 is actually want to minimize r1. So if we plot r1 in, in the graph, and this line will be the action of p1, this one will be the action of p2. So one player want to maximize, the other one want to minimize. So this point will be the saddle point equilibrium because it looks like a saddle. And um, we see that if one player fix his policy here, the other guy change his policy, it getting worse because he want to maximize. And if one player, if, uh, if the other player remain the same, and I change my policy, I also got worse because I want to minimize. So this graph shows a continu continuous action space. The action can be changed well, for a continuous value. And we also have a discrete case shows um, later here. So for the second uh, perspective, we'll come from the game theory. So let's start with the most basic one, the static zero-sum matrix game. Uh, we also start example start with example of rock paper paper scissor game. You see that you have two players, and it's zero sum because the utility sum is zero, or it means that either you win or I win. Um, and there's no situation of win win. And this is a one shot. Just play once and and no more plays. And it's static, so there's no time index. You just get rid of this time index. So this has the discrete action space. You can either choose action, paper, scissor. You have three options. So this means the tie. This means the right wing. This means the blue wing. And uh, also for a uh, static matrix game for two players, but general sum, it's not zero sum. We will have the prisoner dilemma example. It also has a discrete action space, so there's no two criminals. Uh, they can either choose to confess or remain silent. If both of them remain silent, um, they get one year for each. If both of them confess, confess, they get five years for each. If one remains silent, one con confess, that's zero twenty. So we see that um, from um, our perspective, it seems that if the both of them should cooperate and remain silent and get one year for each, it will be best for themselves, for everybody. However, we see that this is not equilibrium because um, for, for this guy, he has the motivation to change from remain silent to confess because if he do that, he can get zero years, although the other guy get 20 years. And similar for this guy, if he confines, he can get zero years. So, and, and finally we see that this state is actually equilibrium because nobody will change from confines to remain silent because and, and they both get five years. So, so it seems strange, but still we got equilibrium of this point. And um, the second point, we have repeated the game. So for the prisoner's dilemma, we just have one shot game. So there's no condition that they can cooperate. But if for a repeated game, that they keep playing this game, um, we may guess that they, ha they can form some trust and can cooperate so that um, they can achieve the social optimal.
and uh, it can be concluded that if the stage T is infinity, it's possible to cooperate and get 1-1 one, one as the equilibrium for the long run. But if T is finite, they cannot cover cooperate, and 5-5 five, five will be the only equilibrium they have. So finally, we have the stochastic game, which means that at each stage, um, you can actually take totally different um, to play totally different actions, get totally different reward, and the state transition will be probabilistic. So now the the action size is state dependent, and that's why uh, the dimension of the matrix is different from stage to stage. Um, because at different state, you can take totally different actions. So, yeah. And, and one more thing, like previously, we just talked about the pure policy, which says the policy is the mapping from the state to action. Um, basically means that for each state, I should know what action I should take. However, um, for multiple players, we should also consider mixed strategy. Note that the pure policy is only a special case of mixed strategy. So what mixed strategy means is that suppose we have three actions, we just take each action with a probability um, p1, p2, p3. It's a probability, so it should be bigger than zero and summation should be one. And the pure policy here just means p1 equal to one or p2 equal to one or p3 equal to one. So why should we do the mixed strategy? The reason is simple. Still take an example of rock, paper, scissors game. If player one plays rock, the other guy will play paper. And then the player one will want to change to scissor. And then the um, player two want to change to, to, to rock. So you see that they will never settle down. And it's not the equilibrium. However, if each player choose to play the op each option with equal probability, one third, then they have no reason to change. And this is exactly what we do in real life. That we just randomly um, pick our option when we play the rock, paper, scissors game with the other. So we're actually already using the game theory, although we may not realize it. So here is um, the epsilon Nash equilibrium, um, a mathematical form. And we say, if this is the equilibrium policy pairs, so if player one deviates from the equilibrium, he get a re he get a loss. If player two deviates from the equilibrium, he get a loss. And this epsilon. Uh, it's just a relaxation because Nash equilibrium may not always exist. So it's just relax and say um, it's not maybe bigger than this guy, but at least it's bigger than this guy minus an epsilon. So finally, um, re re remember that for MDP, we can change it to DP and finally solve it with a linear programming, LP. So we can, uh, for the so toss the game, which is you can think of a modulated MDP, this can al also be solved by a mathematical programming, although it's no longer linear. So this is three conclusions we have. First, it's great because we exist at least one natural equilibrium for this general sum discounted statistical game. And second, we will have um, this mathematical programming which says it if and only if, which is means that they are equivalent. So the optimal point here will be the Nash equilibrium, and at the Nash equ equilibrium, the objective function should achieve the minimum zero. This objective uh, function is always bigger than zero. And third things like uh, because we have a nonlinear programming, is may not always be able to find the. Uh, global opt optimal. So this realization tells you that if you found objective function bigger than zero, suppose gamma, then there's a relationship between the epsilon Nash equilibrium and the gamma, which says that um, if you didn't find the, 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 the global optimal, you, you get some uh, something close to that, 
you will have um, relaxation, epsilon Nash equilibrium. So you see that there is some similarity because f and g will be the probability vector. So they are bigger than zero and have summation over one. And we want to minimize something, and this something should always be bigger than, than something. So at the optimal, the equality is achieved. And uh, the previous part focused on the optimal policy. And we see that there's a lot more things that we can obtain. For example, if you plug in the optimal policy to this multi-agent MDP, you will get a Markov chain. And there's a lot we can say about the Markov chain. For example, the probability distribution of all the future state. So this will be an offline estimation. But and as time evolves, we will know which future state we actually arrived. So we can um, do the online compu uh, compensation by re recomputing and update our estimation of the, the even further future. And also, um, we can have some absorption states. So we have mean time to absorption and uh, like the probability to arrive at absorption state. Um, uh, absorption stage means that once you arrive at this stage, you will never get out. And we can also compare this with non-optimal policy pairs. Um, so change the fine to some, of, some other fine hat. So finally, we see that one thing, one problem is, one challenge with all these things will be the dimensionality or the curse of dimension. And uh, when you have um, more states, you make the computation maybe grows exponentially. So there are some possible solutions. First is that not all, all the transitions are random, and some nodes or state may not be attacked, so they're not necessarily be a game. And also we can see some reliability, sensitivity, and the robustness of the model. And also we can use approximation and uh, try to utilize some um, structure of, of the problem we are trying to solve, like the sparsity. So here is a reference um, that try to solve the large scale uh, Markov game for the infrastructure networks. So we use factor graph and uh, uh, variable eliminations. So you can take a look of the paper, but I will show you that it does work. First, you see that the exact, uh, exact linear programming, LP, have, this is the semi-log. So this grows exponentially with network size. But after the approximation, it grows linear uh, here. Um, or we say that it's insensitive to network size, which is great. And um, But always there is a trade-off. You reduce the complexity, you will have some loss of the accuracy. So this is the exact LP, this is the ALP, and we see that um, the difference here will be the absolute error, which is shown in this number here. You see that it's slightly growing, but because the value is also uh, growing, so the relative error in blue is actually decreasing as the network size grows, so which is great. 